Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners working with older adults be the best they can be. And now your host, Mandy Chamberlain. Hey, OT practitioners, do you have a hard time finding your goniometer in that clutter bag? Tired of digging and dumping your therapy tools in front of clients to find what you're looking for? Sick of carrying a medical bag that looks like a 1970s lunchbox? Well, then you need a Clinitote. Clinitote is a high-quality medical bag that is functional and fashionable. The perfect pockets for finding your important OT tools, made of a hygienic material, and has over-the-door hooks you can hang that bag, keeping it off the floor. Get 30% off your Clinitote bag by going to www www.clinitote.com. That's C L I N I T O T E.com and use my discount code SF Podcast 30. Welcome everyone to the Seniors Flourish podcast. My name is Manny Chamberlain. I'm an occupational therapist and the host of the show. This is where we talk about everything occupational therapy and working with adults and older adults. Today is one of my favorite topics um, is working with people. Uh, patients that have dementia. So we're going to be talking about, you know, understanding dementia, some assessment tools, some tidbits, tips, some different approaches, some things that you can like learn about and take and use in your clinical practice right away. And so my guest is Jenna Maley. She's an She has a doctorate in occupational therapy. She's a registered yoga instructor. She's a certified care manager and just all around has some awesome information to share with everyone today. So welcome, Jenna. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) This is going to be a really great topic and we're trying to pack as much information as we can without being too overwhelming, but we're going to have some really good info for everyone. So let's start... Kind of like, how did you get into OT or what is your OT journey? So I initially actually started in pediatrics. Um, That was what I thought I was going to do with my yoga background. So I was trying to, I did my doctorate work using yoga as a modality in pediatrics. Um, But while I was working on my doctorate, my grandmother actually was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and started experiencing the progression with the dementia symptoms. And so once I finished my doctorate, I actually went and looked for a job in a SNF because I thought, I'm going to go in, I'm going to change how dementia is handled in long-term care facilities. Um, That's a big job. It is. It is. <laughs> I was taking on the world. That's awesome. Um, awesome. So I, I went love, in I because I was really disillusioned in In pediatrics, cognition is a natural part of the evaluation, and it seemed like when I watched my grandmother going through um, occupational therapy, that was not something that was looked at, and I was told by the OT, oh, Medicare doesn't cover it, and this was pre-GEMO versus Sibelius, so um, it, it was definitely more of a red flag then than it technically is now. Now they're looking for us to make sure we're addressing it. So it's a little different. Um, So I was disillusioned really with the model of care I was seeing and reimbursement. So then I went from SNF to home health, which I really loved. And now I've also added in doing private practice, which I love even more. (laughs) What do you do for private practice? Um, I see any clients that need OT really, but I specialize and I'm hoping to build a stronger practice to help families that have dementia. So yeah, thanks for sharing about your private practice and your experience with your grandmother. And you know, those are the things that I think really, uh, push us is when you have some of those, sometimes those personal experiences. So what are some of the things that you see in typical aging versus like dementia? So I see a lot of orthotic changes, so things like hyperkyphosis, arthritis, either osteo or rheumatoid, Um, obviously the cardiovascular changes with um, hypertension and atherosclerosis, you're seeing sensory changes, so declines in hearing, being able to see clearly, and even things like taste will start to change. Okay. Okay. So how about um, in re- in if you compare that to someone who has dementia? So 
There's also actually, sorry, before we move ahead real quick, the changes yeah. with typical aging, you're also going to see a short-term memory change from five to seven things to declines with three to five things. So just typically with somebody that's older, I have to already modify and make sure that I'm giving them more support when it comes to their short-term memory. Um, but when I'm looking at somebody who has dementia, some of the warning signs where I'm like, oh, something may be going on here is when that memory loss is getting to the point where it's disrupting their daily life or mm -hmm. they're demonstrating maybe some planning or solving problems, difficulty with that, um, difficulty completing familiar tasks at, at home, at work, um, in their leisure time, um, confusion with where they are and what time it is trouble understanding visual images or spatial relationships, depth perception is another thing that I'll look at. Um, new problems with, with words, word retrieval, speaking, and even writing too. Um, misplacing things and not being able to kind of retrace their steps to where it was. Um, not having very good judgment. Kind of judgment sort of in the realm of a teenager and you're like, that eh, was a little bit impulsive. Um, but you know, sometimes that's people's personalities. So I kind of have to look at the whole picture and see how many of these red flags are popping up. Um, yeah. and then also the changes in, in mood and personality where they're withdrawing from work or social activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what do you think our role is as OT practitioners in working with our patients that have dementia? Well, according to AOTA, <laughs> Ooh, I, I like official, I like the official definition. Go so, for it. Um, according to AOTA, what they say is our role is to, is enhancing function, promoting relationships and social participation and finding ways for those with dementia to enjoy life. And I love that. And that's what I, I was know. not seeing with the OTs with my grandmother. And I was like, well, I really think OT could play a larger role here. Um, mm -hmm. so AOTA actually goes through and lists, um, that means health promotion, remediation, maintenance, and modification. Mm -hmm. So when I look at that definition, then I start looking at other, like Lori Gitlin and Kathy Pearsall who put together like the tailored activity program. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Why don't you touch base a little bit about. Um, on it. Sure. In case people are not. Um, so the tailored activity program, they used eight sessions for a period over four months. Um, in the interventions, they identified the preserved capabilities, their previous roles, habits, and the interests of the individuals with dementia. And then they developed activities that were customized to each of those individuals. They trained the families in the activity use, and then they documented the time spent and the ease conducting assessments. Um, and in this study, for each implemented prescribed activity, the caregivers were reporting the amount of time their relatives spent in that activity and the perceived benefits. And obviously, it was positive. We all know how powerful occupation and engagement is. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I, I love that because it just kind of reinforces just the research, yeah. research to support what we know to be true that, you know, occupation participation helps in so many different, in so many different people with different diagnoses, but especially with um, engagement with patients that have dementia. And so, you know, you were talking about like with your grandmother as an example that, you know, that you didn't, or they were not doing any kind of like true cognitive assessments. They were just kind of quote, treating her, right? So what are some cognitive assessments? I think some of it is it's kind of overwhelming. Like there's so many different kinds. And um, like, how do you determine which ones do you use? You know, are, are they overlapping? You know, some are long, some are short. Like what, what are some examples um, so of cognitive assessment? I'll typically start out with something like the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's free. It's pretty quick. And it'll give me, especially with word retrieval, I really like that part of the MOCA. Um, mm -hmm. is there, are there red flags? There's actually, have you heard of the RUDIS, the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale? Oh, so, no, but I might need to be looking into it. <laughs> it's also free. And it's of oh, okay. that same kind of, like, it's a quick, easy kind of screen. And it's been, I think they have it in 12 languages, and they've tested it for, for cultural sensitivity. 
And that's important because I'm in LA and there's a lot of different languages and cultures spoken in the places that I work. So Mm -hmm. I've started using the Rudis a little bit more just because of the cultural sensitivity. Oh, yeah. Rudis. And it's I'm writing that down. And it's free. Yeah. What are some other um, types of assessments? Yeah. So once I do kind of a quick cognitive screen and I can kind of yes or no, do I need to look into this further? Um, The next one I really like, and this one's free too, is it's called the cognitive screen for grooming. And it's, it was designed and used to assess cognitive processes in adults with acquired traumatic brain injury. It's a teeth brushing activity, and they break it down to 10 observable steps. And mm-hmm. it, it looks at sustained attention, shifting attention, spatial relations and visual perception, ideomotor praxis, ideational praxis, judgment, awareness, and safety, and problem solving. And in the free manual that you can get online, it defines what each of those things are. So it's really clear about what it is that you're observing. Um, And then it has a form at the very end that's like a grid that you can kind of go through and each of the 10 steps and all the clinical observations. So it gives you a lot of information. And it's just brushing your teeth. I know. And that's actually one of the, I really like that one. I actually never have used it for um, patients with dementia. I've used it like for, you know, Mm. post CVA and that Mm -hmm, kind of thing. mm -hmm. But I mean, but what I specifically like about it is that it is functional. I'm, I am a big functional Mm -hmm. (laughs) assessment kind of gal, but obviously everyone, every type of assessment has their place. Right. But, um, but not only does it look at that executive functioning, but it looks like you were saying that ideomotor and ideational praxis, which I think for me personally, sometimes is really hard to score or quantify and kind of doing that test. They'd let you kind of great, you know, rate Mm -hmm. it. And so that's, you know, part of the whole task. And so then you can kind of look at it and see, are we making, you know, improving or, you know, is it worse or whatever it is. But that's actually one of the other things I really like about that one. And it's not, like you said, it's just grooming yeah I you know mean, it's like an easy it path. anyways yeah and it, but you're, you're looking at it your... from such a different perspective but yeah you're doing it anyway so it's perfect okay sorry I love that one so okay what else do you got um you got? so the next one is also free can you tell <laughs> my <laughs> yes my priorities <laughs> um so I, the next one is the routine task inventory um the I use there's the physical scale, the community scale, the communication scale, scale, and the work readiness scale. And I typically will use the physical scale and the communication scale mostly. Um, mm-hmm. I like that the family and the caregivers can also be involved in reporting and kind of adding dimension to the individual that I'm working with. Uh, do you use the ACL or anything like that? Absolutely, yeah. So I have a whole list of them. The ACL is the next one. Um, Mm -hmm. you, I, I've worked at learning and memorizing the abilities for the sections for the modes of performance. I like that it builds Mm -hmm. on people's abilities and that it's, it's a number and it's, (laughs) I know, I know it, it, it makes sense to other healthcare professionals that I'm talking with when I can give them a number score for some reason that's more comfortable for them <laughs> for some reason. It's well, it, it absolutely is. And you know, it's really, I agree the number, <laughs> you know, like I, I get defensive. I'm just talking about me, like being like my observation skills and my, you know, clinical experience and my, all these things that I know to be true as an OT, I, I'll say, you know, they're showing signs of this, 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 mm-hmm. this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you're like, well, they scored this on the, right. <laughs> ACL or this on the mocha, which isn't even functional, but like helpful. And they're like, oh, okay. And you're like, come on, people. Like, this is what I do for a living. Yeah. That's, that's but, tough. But it is tough. But I agree. The ACL does have, you know, has those numbers and it really can quote categorize, but it focuses on the abilities, which is such a huge way to look at our patients, looking at what they can do, it's which we should do, but like we sometimes have to f- we focus on like documentation and we're trying to do goal setting and you're looking at all what they can't do, but the ACL really focuses on their abilities. Mm-hmm. And 
we, we were talking a little bit earlier about, um, I like to use a cognitive performance test, which is not free and it's very <laughs> expensive. I think it's like five. I may be totally blowing this out of the water. I want to say it's like five or $600. Like, I don't know. I, I, but it's very expensive. Um, but what I like about it is it's, you know, um, research supported. It correlates with the ACL perfectly. That's what it's, that's what it's designed to do. And it has them perform functional tasks in order to assess cognition. And so sometimes I find that um, less irritating to some of the patients uh, um, because yeah. they're actually doing a task that they, you know, is kind of familiar because you can adapt it to what you're seeing. So right. anyway, that's kind of, that's just another one to add to our right. list. What else you got? Um, well, just to, <laughs> before we move on from the Allens, yeah. um, I really also like that they've kind of broadened away from just the lacing activity that they have the, yeah. the visor now and the ribbon card and the needlepoint key ring and the bookmark and the greeting card mm -hmm. and the bead necklace. So it's not just the lacing now. They've expanded. So there's lots of different activities that you can use to um, get a score for them. So again, not free, but very useful and I think not worth the money. Very yeah. useful. Um, definitely, and definitely. then the next one, it moves away from that number score, which is more difficult to have a discussion, especially with planning for discharges, but the Coleman evaluation of living skills, it helps to determine the best living situation to promote safety and health and independence. And it's looking at their self-care, safe, safety and health and money management and community mobility use of the telephone, yeah. um, leisure participation. And I like how holistic it is, but the drawback is, again, it's not free and there's not a number at the end. But mm -hmm. the recommendations I'm making have kind of, you know, I've done these tasks and I can say objectively, we did this task, this was the result, this is what kind of assistance they needed. So mm -hmm. um, even though it doesn't have a score at the end, I do like that I'm able to give a, uh, good recommend a safe recommendation for their discharge planning yeah and it definitely has some of those um IADL components not yep. that not all the yep. other tests yeah. have so um, that is a good one and then these aren't I mean the role checklist isn't exactly an assessment but it does help to build um more of a, a deeper understanding of who that person is about what they're yeah. interested in, understanding like what were their baselines and routines and performance, um, what's their history of enjoying groups of people or personal time, did they like to be a supervisor or a leader, um, were they more of a participant, what were cultural preferences. So even though we technically have the role checklist, I'm kind of informally gathering all of this information on their history continuously as I'm working with people. So that's, yeah. And, it, and that's the information that we want to be able to get anyway, if we're going to be trying to make, you know, client centered yeah. treatment interventions and um, especially for those low patients that have low level, um, that, that have dementia that are like mm -hmm. at a lower level. Mm -hmm. um, and another, do you know the global deterioration scale? So I don't use that a whole lot, but it is really useful because it's used by other disciplines and not just OT yeah. and the ACL works really well with it. So does the FIM and so does the routine task inventory. So the global deterioration scale is another nice one to be familiar with. Yep. Just getting that information. And like you said, a lot of people, other disciplines are familiar mm -hmm. with that. So I feel like if you can sometimes talk, quote, their language, <laughs> that they kind of have a different understanding of what we're trying to, we're looking at and where the patient is. Yeah. So, and then my last, but, the last one I had on my list, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I get excited. I'm a chronic interrupter. I'm a chronic interrupter that has a I podcast. Know. I am too. I'm I so guilty so of it. I get so excited. I <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I, I boast about, not boast, but, you know, try to get people to listen to our patients yeah. and <laughs> make sure we're doing everything we do. And then I'm like the interrupting yep. podcast. I'm just kidding. No, I, no. Yes. Go on, Jenna. What was the last <laughs> one that you had? So the last one's not a formal assessment, but, um, do you know who Lanny Butler is? He's not like a powerhouse. Um, but I do. do you know what? He is from 
UND no where way. I went to college, University of North Dakota. Yes, yes, ma'am. So we have that uh, connection that he doesn't oh, even know. Great. Okay, so I stole this oh, yeah. from yeah. him, and it's not like ev- it's just it's a behavioral <laughs> profile. Amazing. And I went to one of his seminars, yeah. and it was super useful. So I've just kind of taken it and I've shared it in several presentations that I've given. Um, but the behavioral profile mm-hmm. that he shared was. What exactly is happening? Why is that behavior happening? What was the antecedent? Who is involved? Mm -hmm. Where is the behavior exhibited? Mm -hmm. And when does the behavior usually occur? So, yeah. So whenever I do, whenever I have an opportunity to pick up a med B patient, um, I've done a lot of education with nursing in the buildings that I work with to let them know, hey, if you're having difficulty use me. (laughs) I am a resource here for you. Um, And I tell them, you know, if you're having difficulty with dressing or with bathing, don't, don't immediately jump to let's medicate them or, well, Mm -hmm. you know, throw your hands up. That's just dementia. Let's see if I can do something. Let's see if I can. Yeah. I feel like we're very underutilized in that sense. Yeah, I I, I agree. So I (sighs) had... Yeah, I had a little example from it. So I I had a a patient who they kept trying to escape, which is very common, Mm -hmm. um, through unlocked stairwell doors. And they couldn't lock them because that was the fire escape. So Mm -hmm. I went through Mm -hmm. the behavioral profile. So what was happening was that they were escaping through the unlocked stairwell doors. Um, Why was that behavior happening? They were trying to go home. Uh, what was the antecedent? It was them going to the dining room for dinner. Um, who was involved? Typically nursing. And um, when the the behavior usually occurred in the hall in the early evening. So that was actually very simple. <laughs> you instead yeah. of uh, they and they had put a stop sign. That's what they had tried to do. Okay. I think I might have heard this from somebody else, but I I was like, well, why don't we put a closed sign? And that was it. Mm-hmm. We we added a close sign that was and it. the behavior stopped. Isn't that because at a things. stop sign you stop, you look both ways and you go. But at a close sign, keep going. You're like, oh well, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? But it also yeah. I mean it could have also yeah. led to why is it closed? But luckily this person yep. was compliant and was like, Oh, okay, well, I'll I'll try again tomorrow. And that was the end of it. <clears throat> but anyway, so that mm-hmm. was how I've used the behavioral profile before. But I think that behavior prof- profile, I'm totally going to use that because um, I do something very similar. Like I've never found a true assessment. I mean, I do a, you know, a cognitive assessment and that kind of thing. But um, looking at, I always go back to mm-hmm. looking at the why. Mm-hmm. Like why is this happening? Like pe- I think what happens is people are trying to fix what's already occurring instead of looking at like what are some things just like just like that behavioral profile goes through like what are some what are things happening before when is it happening um you know like looking at all those things you can get so much more information instead of like trying to i don't want to say like slap on the band-aid because that's not what we're trying to do but like you're already you're trying to fix the you know the quote behavior but the behavior is only what people are trying it's mm-hmm. them just trying to communicate something and so it's like we have to get behind it and figure out if it needs to just be like you said a simple environmental modification is it um do we need to you know like change some of the patterns that we're doing do they need can they actually not see things or it's something too cold or hot or what like look at it from a different perspective instead of trying to fix the what people are seeing as mm-hmm. an inappropriate behavior. Yeah. There's actually another. But, so I love that behavior. I don't profile. have it with me at just this moment, but the Alzheimer's Greater Los Angeles came up with a similar sort of thing that they teach caregivers, and it's called IDEA. And it's oh. basically teaching the same sort of reasoning of figuring out what is that behavior, mm-hmm. what, why is that behavior, what are they trying to communicate with that behavior, what's the underlying need or desire that needs to be addressed. So that's, no, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Cause I use a lot of, I mean, some of the facilities are definitely easier than others and definitely the smaller facilities that I work at 
the ones that are smaller that where the director of nursing is on board, but I'll even do things like working with like CNA and doing, um, like a behavior log type of thing where, so we can track and say exactly, because sometimes they'll, they'll be like, Oh, they're, you know, doing this X, Y, and Z behavior. And you're like, well, is it, every night at three o'clock? Mm-hmm. Is there, is there consistent, you know, yeah. like three in the morning or is there something going on? And people are like, I don't know. She's just like all night long. They're you know screaming all day and all night. And then they're sleeping during the day. And like, so I'll do like, even a, like a behavior log where you'll have like all the times of the day. And then if something occurs, then the CNA has it right there and they can just note it. And, you know, and I've had some really good luck with that because then you can see the patterns. They're like, oh, it's happening every day at three o'clock. It's happening or, you know, whatever it is, you see the pattern, what's going on, what's happening before, why is that happening? And just modifying some of those things makes such a difference to our patients and their quality of life and then help with the staff and caregiving as well. I mean, the stress, the extra stress it puts on everyone else too. So yeah, it's just a, it's such a, it's yeah. just a different way of looking at it. So how can you use these assessments to create a plan of care or treatment so interventions? I, actually I think sometimes that's something, something from confusing. Caitlin Cleaver on the Geriatric OTPT SLP collaborative page on Facebook. <laughs> um, mm, so yeah. she has a little handout that she shared with everybody and I took it cause I thought it would be really useful for the podcast. So Um, during therapeutic Mm -hmm. exercise, you can work on memorization of the home exercise program and you can use spaced retrieval. So you can give them time to recall what exercise they were doing it after brief, brief breaks in between sets. And you just increase that time between sets to help kind of solidify that routine in the procedural memory because the declarative memory is... Mm -hmm is failing, but the procedural memory is something that we can still work with. So using spaced retrieval to, um, establish a home exercise program. So they're staying strong, um, is really important. Um, looking at things like task completion, are they getting distracted or giving up? Do they know when the task has been completed? Um, so when I do those assessments, it kind of guides me to what areas I want to focus on. So, I can, you know, I can focus on safety awareness and I can use either errorless learning, spaced retrieval. Um, I can modify things based on what was their role history, what things were important to them. So I can kind of link their safety, maybe look at their walker and see how can I make this part of their identity rather than just kind of imposing Mm -hmm. externally like you need this for safety. Um, How can I make that part of who they are? Yeah. Do you have an example of what you've done to do that? Not personally, but I've heard really fabulous stories. Um, In LA, we don't have a whole lot of farmers that I've come across, but I heard a story about where an OT turned the walker into a tractor and put like cardboard around it. I see. So that it was something that the person identified with. And I've um, heard stories of people naming the walker, um, yeah. adding decorations, little pinwheels. Yeah. yeah. I've heard the whole decorating thing. I've actually never done it, but I'm like just making it theirs. And the other thing I've actually heard about the whole decorating thing is that they use like the bright colors. So it's almost like an extra mm-hmm. cue for safety as well, as well as, you know, um, identifiers, like having a connection to it, but also being like, Hey, this is really bright and in my face. Right. And Oh, I, maybe I should be using it from the assessments. I'll also know is visual scanning something that they're still doing. Do I need to, you know, kind of coach them on that? What's their spatial orientation like? And so depending on what results I've gotten from the assessments, Maybe I involve the patient in setup a little bit more. Maybe I don't a lot of times, and I don't know if this is good or bad as an OT. I don't even tell people that I'm an OT. I'll just go in and be like, hey, I'm here Mm -hmm. to visit. Mm -hmm. You know, I need a little help with this project. Would you mind helping me? And depending on like their role history, like were they a supervisor or were they a participant? And I can use that information to engage them in a session with me. And a lot of my patients are like, I don't need OT. I'm fine. I'm like, well, the doctor disagrees. Um, So a lot of times I don't even introduce myself as an OT. I'll just go in and kind of socially visit with them. And I know what goals I'm working on. The family knows what goals I'm working on. But a lot of times there's a lot less resistance when I don't tell them, hey, it's time for your therapy. (laughs) 
Yeah. And it's just building that rapport. And that's kind of like what I was talking about with the functional assessments too. Sometimes I find that, you know, you're, instead of being like, we're going to sit down and fill out this piece of paper and tell me how to mm-hmm. draw a clock. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's not amazing information that we need and it's appropriate, um, in, obviously in some different settings, but depending on the patient like that, some people just do not want to do that. Right. And so sometimes those functional assessments, um, are helpful in the same type of way. Like you're just kind of like you're working on the we're working on the goals. Um, everyone knows what we're doing. We know what we're doing. The family knows what we're doing. Um, improving that quality of life and just a different approach. It's all about it's a, a it's lot about so, approach. Yeah, I it found really <laughs> is. And that have dementia. the assessments also <laughs> allow me the when I go in to see the patient, am I going to give them an either or, or am I going to ask an open ended question? You know, so how am I going to start the session? Mm -hmm. Um, Once we kind of get going, it's usually pretty good. But that initial kind of how am I, how am I entering their space? Am I using Tipa Snow's positive physical approach or am I sneaking up on them? Because I've learned that the positive physical approach exists for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about that because I am all about the positive physical approach as well. So let, let's talk about that and how, um, what it is so and how I, you've what used I, it. The notes that I sent you, there's actually a handout that's available. Is okay. it possible for you to be able to share that with okay. listeners or? Absolutely. Awesome. I'll put it in the show so notes. So the positive physical Definitely. approach. So this is something that's hopefully spreading like wildfire because approaching somebody who has um, peripheral vision deficits, it would startle anybody if you come from the side. So when you're approaching somebody using the positive physical approach, Mm -hmm. you want to approach from the front. And one of the other things that Tipa Snow talks about is understanding um, social, social distance, personal distance, and then intimate space. Um, And as therapists, I see this a lot in the buildings I go to where somebody is sitting in their wheelchair, you know, along the wall and somebody will come up from the side and put their hand on somebody's shoulder. And they're very polite most of the time and we'll just kind of turn and be like, oh, hello. But other times that startles them. And then you've already kind of impaired that relationship before you've even gotten going. So using the positive physical approach, coming from the front, stop moving when you're in that boundary between public and personal space. So about six feet out, get permission to enter and approach them. So give them, you know, a visual cue, say hi, you know, use a friendly voice. You know, I, I know that sounds silly to say, but a lot of people get into their work day and it's, they've just had a tough patient and they're like, all right, I just got to grind out the next few patients. But how you approach somebody and how you start that interaction makes a big difference on if it's going to be a successful one or not. And they may not remember who you are, but they will remember how you made them feel. So that approach is very important. So um, using an open hand motion near the face with a smile, you're going to engage like their social reaction. So you want to look friendly, give the person a visual cue, make eye contact, um, and call the person by their preferred name. Or at least, you know, a high, some sort of endearment. Um, and move your hand out from near your face to a greeting into a handshake position. And, and really, honor, if they don't reach their hand out to meet yours, they're not ready for you right then. And, and respect that and come back later. Mm-hmm. Um, Tipa Snow has some really amazing ways to kind of turn that around. But... I'm still working on being in channeling my te- inner Tipa Snow. I know. I'm a huge Tipa Snow fan as, fan as well. Why don't you talk about who Tipa Snow is and talk a little bit about her, oh, just man. the basics of kind of what her theory and <laughs> approach is. I know this is a big topic, yeah. but let's just like, you know, we're going to condense it down. And, and, and she has lot, Tipa has lots of videos on YouTube and she has tons of amazing resources working about working with right. people with dementia. So tell share so, oh gosh, your so much. she knowledge. i was originally introduced <laughs> to her at i think the long beach aota conference so a while back and somebody just mentioned it in passing i was like oh i'm gonna look that up and i have been a total tipa snow groupie ever since um she actually have you heard of the app that she has that's free the dementia assist Oh my gosh, you totally have to get it. It's Dementia Assist and the A at the end of Dementia and Assist are shared. It's a free application and 
You can share okay. it with families, with caregivers, and it's a way to problem solve um, and understand what behaviors are trying to communicate and what you as the care partner can do to um, address those behaviors. So, yeah. I, I know. There's so many things. She has tons of YouTube videos. Um, so I didn't fit. So a positive physical approach is something she came up with and has shared all over the place. So it's not just coming from the front, but it's connecting with that person. So you do the handshake and then you slide into a position called hand under hand, which is difficult to explain, but it's kind of like um, mm-hmm. if you were going to be arm wrestling with somebody, it is. it's that s- sort of position. Um, yeah, that's a good way. And like palm to palm kind of thing. Like, yeah, you really do. Up, I, I wish I you could describe it, it better, but it's <laughs> a podcast. So you want to move slowly. Yeah. They're processing <laughs> yeah. things at a different speed. So moving slowly, having that hand under hand connection, and then getting to the side of the person and then getting to their, their level to talk, you know, sitting, squatting, kneeling. So that's, that's her, that's what she came up with, the positive approach to care. Um, that's, that's how you kind of engage with somebody at the beginning. And she has something called the gem levels and that's similar to the ACL, but I think more easily grasped by people who don't work in healthcare. So they have, she has the Sapphire, which she calls the true blue and that's optimal cognition with a healthy brain. Um, there's the diamond, which is clear and sharp and likes routines and rituals. So they will display many facets, behavior and perspectives can shift really dramatically. They prefer familiar things, may resist change. They're really challenged by transitions. They present with a lot of like very rigid, self-focused um, tendencies. They see their wants as needs when they're, when they're stressed. Um, then... The emerald, that's green on the go with a purpose. So emeralds are naturally flawed. And this is all Tipa Snow stuff. I'm just kind of sharing what I've, I've received from her. So the emerald sees themselves as able and independent, and they have very limited awareness about their changes in ability. So safety starts to be more of an issue because their insight is more impaired at this stage. Um, they very much live in the moment. Um, they understand and use language, but they're a lot more vague and they repeat things a little bit more. So you're starting to see, oh, they're conversational, but they're on repeat a little bit. Um, they'll need cues and support getting from one place to another and doing their daily routines without getting distracted. Um, because their awareness of time and place and situation doesn't always match the current reality. Um, they also have really strong emotional reactions that can be triggered by fears or desires or obviously unmet needs. Um, they tend to do better when they know what's coming next. So they'll seek guidance and assistance to kind of fill the day. Um, and then the next one is Amber and they're caught in the moment of time, caution required, uh, focused on sensations. They seek to satisfy desires. They try to avoid what they don't like, like many of us. <laughs> um, yeah, it right. kind of sounds like me. Um, like, the environment yeah. really can drive their actions. So environmental <laughs> modifications are really important in this stage. Um, their visual abilities are limited. So they focus on pieces or parts and aren't so good at looking at the whole picture. So one of the things I learned from Tipa Snow is using kind of a visual boundary, something like a placemat that has contrast so that they can find things more easily. Um, They tend to cross boundaries to into other people's space. So understanding personal boundaries is, is not so much there. Um, they have periods of intense activity. They are very curious and repetitive with objects and actions. A lot of times care is refused or seen as threatening. So using that positive physical approach is really important and understanding what they're, what makes them feel safe. 
And Tipa has so many videos on how to be mm. respectful mm-hmm. and help somebody feel safe, including like, I love the, you know, covering them with warm towels when you go to shower and then wetting them either through their clothes or through the towel. You yes. Know, what do you do when you have wet clothes on? You take them off. Mm-hmm. So why have a fight to have somebody remove their clothes when <laughs> yeah. if you get them wet, it'll be a more natural thing like, oh, they're wet. I'll take them off now. Yeah, those and those little tips that she gives, you're just like, that makes so much compl- and complete sense. Yeah. It's like, oh. So I use a lot of a lot of her yeah. stuff too. And you know, Tipa is she is an occupational therapist. And so she she doesn't really like go at it. She doesn't say, I'm an occupational therapist and stuff like that, but she is. And so you see those correlations between her gem levels and like, like you're saying, ACL mm-hmm. levels to a, you know, a degree of the repetitive, I mean, you, you see it, right? And so it's super interesting because um, some facilities are completely, you know, they do, they'll be like, a, I don't know if they, they don't call them Tipa Snow facilities, but they, you know, they use her philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um and then everyone understands what the gym levels mean and what type of approach. It but really that's, I mean, is. that is yeah. a high functioning facility. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. But I mean, she has so many great, great tips. That is just mm-hmm. so helpful. And then she and has the ruby. I've learned a lot from her along um, the way. And the pearl levels, which are the, you know, the two and the ACL and the one and the ACL. So those are kind of the lower levels. So the the ruby mm-hmm. level is where you're making use of rhythm and. Um, a lot more sensory based stuff. They tend to miss obviously subtle hints, um, but magnified facial expressions and, and voice rhythms are still um, often intact. And she also yeah. has cards actually so that helpful. go through each of the it. gem levels. I think they're called like care cards. And, th- and she has her own kind of mm-hmm. way of doing a behavioral profile type thing with her cards to do that problem solving with the people who are um, mm-hmm. care partners to people with dementia. So can't recommend her enough. So how about some um, different approaches? How about like yeah. um, like neurofunctional? So it's something I was introduced to by another Facebook person. Do you know who Chris Narwal- Narwald is? I may be mispronouncing his last name. That's where I came across the neurofunctional approach. And I really like it. It sort of echoes a lot of the other things that I've learned when it comes to um, dementia care. And that's Um, He kind of blends multiple therapeutic techniques, but learning by doing, which we know, daily practice, repetition, 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 (laughs) all that airless learning, um, talking about forward chaining, backward chaining. And then the other thing I really like is I started being able to document better about what sort of cognitive assist I was giving because I would give, I would do indirect questioning. I would offer milk choices and then I would give direct commands, but I wasn't documenting what sort of verbal cue I was providing. And after reading through the neurofunctional approach, I understood more like, oh, a minimal verbal cue would be indirect questioning. And a moderate verbal cue would be giving them multiple choices. Right. And then the max verbal cue would be giving them a direct command. So yeah. being able to... Yeah, and I think that's really useful for other therapists coming that in yeah. to continue the um, care, the continuity of care. So that's, I there's a lot more to the neurofunctional approach, but that's what I found as most useful that I've added to my practice. I know those are the things like that, those little tips that really make it that much easier. Because I find, as someone who works a lot of PRN, um, I find working with patients that have dementia. Um, one of my mm-hmm. favorite populations to work with, but filling in, it's my hardest because you, mm-hmm. it's, I find, I think people have a really hard time documenting um, clear goals. And I feel like people have a hard time having a true, um, like a treatment plan. Like we have a treatment plan, but like actually having some kind well, of. Well, yeah, like because if you're doing the real airless treatment learning plan, or does the that chain, make sense at all? Like it, it just kind of instead of. Like, exactly the same, or else it's new. And then you're starting mm-hmm. over at, at zero. But it's hard to get that. And documentation is, a, I know, an area that a lot of people kind of struggle in anyway. Um, but like tips like that, I'm saying like, okay, this is actually what min assist means. Or this is exactly what, you know, min verbal cues means. And like being able to kind of have a clear understanding of what it is. It makes documentation easier, which makes continuity of care better, which makes 
ideally outcomes for the patient and quality of life better. I know. And, I know. Um, it's really challenging. It's always and the other thing, easier said going than back done, to Lanny for Butler, sure. Are you familiar with his advanced directive thing that he put together? Oh my gosh. So it's not maybe no. the easiest thing to do, but in my private practice, I've started using it a lot more because I can work mm -hmm. with people right after the diagnosis. So it's a little bit it's before things have gotten more severe most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I can go through and use this advanced directive and it goes through when you get out of bed, you get out on the left or the right. Um, when you get dressed, you put your pants or your shirt on first. So it's figuring out what, what is the baseline for their procedural memory? What do they do without thinking? Because if we have that awareness of what their history was mm -hmm. and what their um, mm -hmm. routines were, we can plug into that versus trying to impose and create a new memory or a new motor habit. So he has like this whole thing that he went through and I stole that one too. <laughs> well, that's, I think that's what's awesome about, um, you know, all these, it's, it's mm -hmm. gathering all this, it's putting together your OT toolbox and figuring out what works for you. And then you'll be able to kind of dig through and say like, this is going to work best for my patients. And it's like, you know, we need to be a student, a student of OT for our entire career. So we can always progress and learn what's new and what's the best research. And it, yeah. it is easier said than done. I, I probably say that a hundred times mm -hmm. in all these episodes because mm -hmm. I tend to be very optimistic and a little idealistic, but I just have such a passion for like us being the best that we can be. And like, showing that and helping our patients succeed. And we're not always going to get it a hundred percent, but I just love having that uh, toolbox. And sometimes, you know, you put something in there and then you are like, this is the most amazing technique I've ever used. And then you forget about it. And then you crack it out. Like two years later, you're looking through your resources. You're like, Oh my gosh, I should be using this. And it's just like, but at least you have it and it's all, you know, together. Yeah, and it's, I think the other hard part is little tips we're not train. alone. And so if you don't have a whole team that's on board, it's really hard to function at the top of your license as an OT in this area because you're not the only one. If nursing is oh, doing, gosh. if nursing is doing dressing differently than you're doing it, it's going to create a problem. You're not going to be able to keep progressing because they're being started over at zero yeah. every day. They're undoing the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. So that communication and that team approach is really essential. <laughs> it is. It is essential, essential, essential. So do you have any, like, um, any patient, like, stories that you'd like to share <laughs> or case studies that of, like, some successes? Some People love examples. I love examples of some things, well, like, you're like, oh, I yes, have, that's something I well, could try or well, this really worked for you. Yes, or, I do. I have, I have like a that. few stories. I'm trying to think which one. So remembering <laughs> that auditory processing for somebody that has dementia symptoms is 30 to 90 seconds, which is a lot more time than I realized and I made the mistake. I had a patient who said, I need to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. So I said, okay, well, we'll go use the bathroom. That's an OT thing. And by the time we got back to her room, she's like, oh, I, you know, I already had an accident. And I said, oh, that's okay. So I went and got her nurse. And um, the nurse said, well, can we just stand her up and I'll change it really quick while she's standing next to her bed? And I said, yeah, that's fine. I was still new. I was still learning kind of the ropes. I was, you know, trying to work together with nursing. And so I, I turned to her and I said, okay, we're going to stand you up. I didn't give her time to respond. And as a result, she was still going to the bathroom. And it was all over my shoes then. Because mm. as we stood her up, because I hadn't given her that time to respond and say, yes, that's okay. Turn it. I you know, she, she was still doing her business. And so I had to get new shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but really giving them that full time to respond. And then if they don't repeating that same simple phrase again and waiting, there's a lot of patience. <laughs> so, you know, you learn from your mistakes. So that was a learning experience. Um, a more positive story where I was like, Oh my gosh, it works. So I went through Lanny Butler's behavioral profile. We had um, a client who had Parkinson's, had recently fallen at home, had a total hip replacement. They had put him in a recliner wheelchair. No, not a high-backed wheelchair. And, how, and he was a small guy. So they 
had positioned him in this wheelchair because they thought it would be more difficult for him to get out of. But then he was just taking the wheelchair with him and his legs were like behind the leg rests. So it was becoming a very serious fall situation because not only could he fall, but the wheelchair could then <sighs> yeah. fall on top of him. So I went in, I did my behavioral profile. I looked at his prior occupation used to be, he was a physician at a hospital. <clears throat> so I found out, the, and it was happening, this behavior of him trying to get up during nursing shift and he was trying to go home. So it, it made sense. He thought he was there to be a doctor. He's like, oh, nurses are going home. It's time for me to go home. So that's what he was trying to do. So as an intervention, I made him his own medical chart, and I put tabs in it. And then right before nursing shift change, I would give him the medical chart, and I would ask him, doctor, we need your signatures on a couple of pages. And I would give him the, the medical binder. I would give him a pen, and he would go through and he would just sign everything. And then once the nursing shift had already happened, he was, he was engaged in activity. So he wasn't being triggered by the nurse shift change Mm -hmm. that he wasn't trying to go home anymore. He was busy doing an activity. I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, it really works. That is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I was so excited. And the family was really excited. You just like want to sell it to the world. He felt like he had a purpose. He had a reason to be there because otherwise he was just sitting in the wheelchair all day. Well, not all day, but you know what I mean. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I love that example so much. I might have to use it somewhere. (laughs) But that's a great example of like really being client-centered as well. I mean, in addition to, you know, having them participate in those, you know, activities that are meaningful to them. But it's like, if you can dig into and really get a good understanding Mm -hmm. of who this patient is, which is hard to do when you have patients that have dementia. So you have to look at what they have in their room, talk to the family, talk, you know, like get a good background. But those are the, the things that pay off and it's, it makes it fun, like fun as in like fun to do your job. And the quality of life for your patients is like amazing. Their client <laughs> that um, was losing weight. So that's why we picked up under med B and I looked at stuff and I'm like, well, they're spilling like 75% of their food and it was because of their position. So when the nurses would bring them into the dining room, they didn't want to get too close to the table. And this actually came from Tipa Snow is where I came up with this intervention. It was super simple, but because they had decreased visual acuity, their peripheral vision was impaired um, and their shoulder movement, they, they would, they thought the table was closer than it was. So it, the intervention that I provided was stop as soon as they, you know, ask you to stop, then ask them, help them put their hands on the table and then bring them in so that their positioning is better. And voila, then they were eating and not spilling so much because they were not, you know, five feet away from the table. <laughs> and those are the things that sound so obvious, yeah. but... So, it's and then, not, you know, setting up the, you know, the plate like the everyday and utensils work. so there was contrast. Um, the placemat they had used was basically the same color as the table. So we changed the positioning, we gave them a visual boundary, and then they started eating much better. <laughs> so simple. Keep a snow to the rescue. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> <gasps> Via Jenna. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, that's great. I love I love those examples. Yeah, I mean, you have some of those uh stories. I think everybody has had those, you know, those successes um that make it just really fun. I can think of one example of a one of my patients that um she we kind of did, like I said, I kind of went through a, like a behavior log kind of thing and they were taking, finding that she was having, mm. so every day at every meal, she was yelling and screaming and throwing, throwing food and throwing plates and th- like just super agitated in the dining area. And then, but then what would happen is because no one wanted to disrupt her, like no one wanted to make her mad, then like the staff, because she could s- technically self-feed, like then they wouldn't like interact with her, right? Because they didn't want to make her mad or have her throwing things or whatever. 
So we kind of, Mm. you know, repositioned her in the dining area so she didn't have as much stimulation. We increased the contrast on, you know, we did the red plate thing, um, which she thought was fabulous, um, but she could see it better. Um, But like just changing her position, you know, because I was like trying to advocate, like, can we get her into it? It's hard when you're in these big dining areas sometimes, Um, but just... Didn't want to isolate her, mm-hmm. but yeah. trying to just get her. So I tur- so she wasn't facing the crowd. She was facing away from the crowd. <laughs> but she could see her table mate. But she was kind of, they were kind of like in a corner area. And it was like night and day. Like, it wasn't like completely gone. She was still a bit agitated when it got noisy. But, I mean, it went down at yeah. 75%. And it was just by the sensory overload. She was experiencing, you know? and so it's like those little things that really make a difference. Do you have any like top takeaway tips that you think OT practitioners should really kind of like if when we're, we're if you're new to working with patients that have dementia or you struggle with working with patients that have dementia? What are some just some hard, concrete tips? Got to build that relationship with them. So understanding what therapeutic use of self is understanding how to modify your communication techniques to fit the situation um, mm-hmm. and, and being aware of when you're alternating between social talk and task talk and knowing where are they at and is this appropriate? Because a lot of times when we get nervous or we're new with something, we tend to talk a lot more. Um, but that's confusing and can be agitating for somebody that has dementia. And it's hard for them to keep up. So understanding where they're at and modifying how you're interacting with them to allow them to be more successful. I guess that would be my takeaway tips. Um, Working with them and and helping to enjoy life with them. And I also, have you read um, Dementia Beyond Drugs? So I, another one of my many soapbox issues is the language of caregiver versus care partner. Um, so I try to use the word (laughs) care partner more than caregiver and you already know why, because caregiver implies that you're the one that has all the answers. You're the one that's providing all the care and it really doesn't empower the person with dementia to be part of that process. It puts them in always being in a receiving position. And if you say care partner, then, then you guys are more equals and that person is more involved in the process. So yeah, understanding the difference between care partners and caregivers and trying to approach care as a partner and not as just a giver. Because being a caregiver sure, sure. No, of is course, exhausting. of course. I mean, even being a care partner is exhausting, but it, <laughs> but it's just it's just it's such a job and you cannot underestimate the um tax it is on relationships and, you know, just yeah. s- physical and emotional um, well-being. But it's, it's a big yeah. job. Tell me more about it. You know, those little phrases allow you to be more of a partner than, mm. you know, the boss. <laughs> awesome tips. Very, very helpful and useful. And people can, like, take those and use them right away. I think in just wrapping up, I just wanted to say thank you, Jenna, for all this information. It's I think it's a really good jump start and you know, kind of getting people more familiar or comfortable with working with dementia and lots of really helpful ideas. I have so many things to add to this podcast. But I think even just like a little cognitive screen checklist, because I think, you know, people just don't even know there's just so many. And not everyone's appropriate, but gosh, it makes it easier when you can kind of break down and see which ones are easiest. And if you can do, this is my soapbox, but if you can do really good evaluation and get really good information on the front end, your treatment plans and your daily treatment um, and interventions are going to be that much easier um, because you know exact, you have a clear focus on what needs, what the patient's abilities are and what we need to be working towards. So. Thank you again for all your wonderful information. Um, And so thanks everyone for listening. And until next time. If you are an occupational therapy practitioner that enjoyed today's podcast, I invite you to check out the Learning Lab at seniorsflourish.com forward slash learning lab. 
The Learning Lab is the essential resource for OT practitioners working with older adults looking for more treatment ideas, support, and resources to be the best they can be. So whether you're struggling to find evidence-based treatment ideas, you don't have time to research for resources or patient diagnoses, or are even looking for ways to earn more professional development units, then the Learning Lab can help you become a more effective and efficient practitioner. With weekly educational videos, a huge resource and handout list, a bi-monthly journal club where you can earn professional development units, a supportive community forum, and even some exclusive member-only bonuses, the Learning Lab is the perfect place to help you be the best OT practitioner you can be. It's like having your own OT help desk. So check it out at seniorsflourish.com forward slash learning lab. Thanks for listening. Thank you.